All right, so we were talking about products last time, and I need to finish uh, talking about products today. And we, we started out discussing product development um, in terms of the common law rule of caveat emptor moving into a theory of negligence in which manufacturers of products will be liable if they don't exercise a reasonable standard of care. And so I asked you, when you think about these, to think about whether or not Anglo-American jurisprudence is predicated largely on two theories, utilitarianism and uh, duty, either teleological or duty ethics. And so I asked you what you thought uh, these, were, these different theories were based on. What do you think caveat emptor was based on? We sort of got into, towards the end there, thinking about, I think, negligence. What do you think caveat emptor was based on? Utilitarianism or duty? I think it was utilitarianism. If we, we, if we don't put a lot of requirements out there, people will manufacture things and we'll let the free hand of the market sort of decide what products should stay and what products will fail, what will rise and what will, will fail. And one of the things that we hear in the political marketplace today <laughs> is this argument that we are over-regulated. There are too many regulations out there. There are all kinds of things that we have to do and worry about from a manufacturing standpoint because we've got to be fearful of court litigation. So I think it was utilitarian to say, look, people ought to be able to produce stuff. They ought to be able to put it out there in the market and, and let, the, let the free end of the market uh, take its toll. And those products that are not great will fall and be uh, not successful. And those that are useful will, will rise to the top. The problem with that, as I indicated last time, was really that in an era that was largely agricultural and pre-industrial, we could probably judge the quality of products fairly well. And even in the early industrial era, we could probably judge the quality of products fairly well. If you were going out to buy a horse, you probably could judge, you know, if you lived back at the turn of the century, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, the late 19th and early 20th century, you could probably judge whether or not the horse was any good because you had some experience and you, you had some knowledge base. But can you judge in the current era your car? Are you even able to evaluate the safety of your car? I think that becomes more problematic. So we move to this theory of negligence, which I think negligence is based on duty. Negligence is the, it starts with, what is it that's the element of negligence? What's the first element of negligence? Duty. Right? You have to have a duty, you have the breach of the duty, you have injury and then causation. And then we move from there to strict products liability. Where we say, if you manufacture something and somebody's hurt, it doesn't matter how careful you were in the manufacturer of that, we're going to hold you liable. We're going to make you responsible. And business students generally don't like this one. And I suggested last time that this is based on purely utilitarian theory. Who's in the better position to pay for the injury, you or the company? So let's think about this case. It's called Searcy versus Ford Motor Company. Willie Searcy is riding in the front seat of his father's Ford F-150 pickup truck. What is the Ford F-150 pickup truck, by the way? As marketers, this should come tripping off your tongue. It's the what? It is the most popular truck in history. And they tell you this all the time, right? That it's the most number one selling truck in America for 14 years running is the Ford F-150. What does that mean with regard to Ford F-150s? There are a hell of a lot of them out there. Willie Searcy is riding in the front seat of his father's pickup truck going through Dallas, Texas. And if you've ever been through Dallas, Texas on the 635, you know that it's an absolute, complete, and utter nightmare, particularly at rush hour. 
He drops something on the floor and his stepfather tells him to pick it up. It's a candy wrapper. And he leans forward and as he's leaning forward, his father is not paying attention and slams into the back of another vehicle. Because he was applying constant pressure as the, his father slammed into the back of this other vehicle, the tension regulator on the shoulder harness of the belt didn't engage. You all have experienced this numerous times, right? If you're in your car and you're just moving around the tension regulator and you don't apply a sudden jerk to the seat belt, we'll let you bend over, uh, you know, touch the dash, things like that. And as a result of this movement that he was doing, the tension regulator failed and Cersei slams into the front windshield of his father's pickup truck. Now, seat belts in the olden days, in the back seat particularly, were very dangerous because they are really wonderful devices for keeping your little body intact, but without a shoulder harness, what happens is the seatbelt can actually cause internal bleeding and you can be thrown forward and get other things that can be problematic. And in some instances, those seatbelts will just slice you right in half if you're, if you're not careful. So he hits the front windshield of his father's vehicle and he becomes a paraplegic, no, a quadriplegic completely paralyzed from the neck down. And the case goes to trial. Of course, who do they sue? Under a doctrine of strict products liability, all people in the channel of distribution are jointly and severally liable for the damage. Again, we take away duty. We're not saying that Ford didn't try to manufacture a safe vehicle. They did. That's one of the reasons that we have airbags in vehicles, and that's one of the reasons that we now have these shoulder straps in the seatbelt, because we learned as a result of car accidents, particularly from people in the back seat, or people in, if you go into a 1950s or 60s car, they may have seatbelts in the front that are just lap belts, and again, those were problematic because although it keeps your little body there, it can lead to problems with internal bleeding and other organs. And so we've, we've done all these things to make it more and more safe, to the point that vehicles now are enormously safe. I, one of the things I love is when people say they don't make them like they used to. Well, thank God they don't make them like they used to, because even in the 1980s, the average car, if it went to 100,000 miles, it was on its last legs. And you're going to have lots of problems. We now have cars that are enormously safe in that they have airbags, they have safety harnesses, they have seat belts, they have crush zones, and all of these things that have been designed to make them more safe. And yet we're going to say to the manufacturer like Ford, look, who's in the better position to pay for Willie Searcy's Insurance for Ford. Now, intuitively, this seems right that if we do a utilitarian analysis, that's the useful or maximization of happiness or at least the minimization of pain. But let's think about this. My first cell phone that I got in high school. I graduated from high school in 1992. So, some of you weren't even born in 1992. Or that was the year you were born, it was 1992. I got a cell phone when I was a sophomore in high school. That phone weighed about 10 pounds. <laughs> it came in a bag, looked like a little briefcase bag. It had a battery that was enormously clunky. That's why you had to have the bag, so that you had this huge battery. You could talk on that device with the battery for about 15 minutes, and the battery would die. It had a life of being on. The battery charge would hold for about 24 hours if you were just if it was just on to receive. But the minute you started receiving phone calls, 
the battery would drain in about 15 minutes, which is why it came with this real convenient core that you plugged into the cigarette lighter. It was this big bulky thing that you plugged into the cigarette lighter and that would keep it going. In order to talk on that phone, I had to drive to the top of the hill and get through because there weren't that many cell towers at that time. And it cost $1,000. This is in 1990. My phone cost about $1,000. That technology is so ancient, you all wouldn't even recognize it today. Most of you have never even seen a rotary phone, probably. There's a case in criminal law when I used to teach criminal law and procedure about a phone booth. And students would start raising their hands and say, what's a phone booth? They never, there used to be these things on street corners that you, before you had this, that you would go into and plunk in. When I was growing up, it started out as uh, 15 cents to make a phone call, and then it was a quarter to make a phone call. And now they don't even have these things because drug dealers are using them, so they take them out. Everybody's got their own cell phone now, right? So we don't, we don't have these phone booths anymore. And $1,000 in 1990 was, you know, if we do the time value of money, worth a lot more. I mean, the cost would probably be somewhere closer to $2,000 today if we factor in inflation. Well, what does this device cost? If you buy it right out, about $1,000. It's not $1,000. If you buy it right out, what does an iPhone 6 cost? They're 600 bucks, right? That's what they are. They're 600 bucks through AT&T if you buy them out, right? And actually, this model you can finally get for a lot cheaper because what's happened to the price of this model as a result of them releasing the new? What's the new iPhone? This is this is old technology now. What is the new one? The iPhone 6. What? The iPhone 6s. And is it that much better than this one? So once they release the new model. What happens to the price of this one? Have you have you seen one? Have you used it? Have you seen a 6S? I sell them. You sell them? We have the SE now. Oh, the SE. It's, oh, we're no longer on just the 6S. The SE's out now. What does the E stand for? I don't know what it stands for. All it is, it's the same technology as the 6S. It's just in the iPhone 5 model. It's just a smaller phone. Okay. So. This model, this is a six. The cost of this new probably has dropped to what? I would say it's probably three. If you, if you, I don't know. If you go to a five, what can you buy a five for? What? A hundred bucks. It's it's so. I mean, it's still a fairly decent phone. Lots of people are still walking around with the iPhone five. Anybody in here have the iPhone five? A few of you still have the iPhone. So you're and and you can still get online and do that. And it's about a hundred bucks, right? And you can still answer your email and text messages and things like that. The price of this technology has dropped radically over the years. The minute these come out, they're really expensive. And I had friends who got the first iPhone and they paid they stood in line, they got it the day it came out, and I said, Was it worth it to have it? for the three months before the price plummeted and fell. And they insisted that it was. Again, going back in time and dating myself, when I was growing up, these were really expensive pieces of equipment. They were big, they were bulky, they were only in green and black. The screens were green and black. And you, you spent a lot of money on them and you took care of them. What does this monitor cost now? Do you want to buy I mean, this? This monitor is a hundred million times better than the monitors on the computers that we had when I was a kid in school. That, like I said, they were a green screen. We had to use DOS. You all probably don't even remember what DOS is or haven't seen it. Anybody know what DOS stood for? It actually started out as QDOS. Microsoft didn't actually invent QDOS, did they? They bought it. And what did QDOS stand for? Quick and Dirty Operating System. And they basically snapped on some stuff and forced it off a crappy product on the 
entire planet, which they continue to do version after version after version of. What can you buy a monitor like this for now? Huh? 100 bucks. And I'd be willing to bet that at the school, since we bought them in bulk, and get a state contract, we probably paid around 50 for this. And the minute it's no longer really, we want new ones because there's something else, and we try to surplus these, how much do you think we get for them in our surplus? So we'll surplus these in probably four or five years. We'll surplus these monitors. They'll be sent to state surplus, and the Office of Management and Enterprise Services for the state of Oklahoma will sell them off. And you can buy lots of these. Lots. And I don't mean lots as in a big quantity. Well, I do mean that. But I also mean they sell them in these lots. And you can buy a lot, which is probably 50 monitors for $50 from state surplus. You just go online and you can bid for it. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because the price of this device used to be enormously expensive. We took care of them, we treated them. And one of the reasons that we still have this paranoia about locking the classroom doors is because this technology used to cost a lot of money and people would come in and actually steal it. People don't steal stuff like this anymore. Why? Because it's cheap. You can buy it cheaply. You can get it at surplus. You can get it at, at a pawn shop for 20 bucks. It's not worth anything. And that's because the price is just, in these kinds of goods that we are able to mass produce, has dropped astronomically. Now why is the price dropped on that? Price Pritchett, who is an expert in business pricing, has argued that if we had similar price decreases in automobiles and technology that we've seen in telephones and computers, the price of a car should cost about a hundred bucks. And it hasn't. What we've seen is this device went from being several, probably, you know, close to a thousand bucks when I was a kid. You buy a computer, you have to buy this monitor, and the monitor may be five, six, seven hundred dollars. And those monitors are nothing compared to this. Why is this cheap and the price of a car really, really expensive? Well, it's because of strict products liability. There's nothing inherently dangerous with this product. You're not going to get a whole lot of manufacturing lawsuits from people saying, the monitor hurt me. Now, I don't know, maybe we will see in the future as we become more and more dependent on people for protection and for government for protection, we might start saying, you know, I didn't have to wear glasses until I went to law school. Never had to wear glasses. I was not at all myopic until I went to law. And I probably shouldn't tell you all this because it encourages you to, to not read, but I never opened a textbook until I went to law school. I graduated summa cum laude with a 4.0 grade point average, never opened a textbook. Had a horrible fear of reading, just like all of you. Why? Reading, reading makes you speak me. Right? And all of a sudden, you get to law school and, well, Holy cow, you, you, you know, the, the role is reversed. The professor walks in on the first day of class and calls somebody's name. And if you haven't gone to law school and you don't know, and you don't have family members that have gone to law school, what ends up happening is they'll say, why don't you tell us about Coyle versus Smith? You don't know what the case is because you haven't been bright enough to go over to the library and figure out what you need. And I knew all this because my, my family were all lawyers. You have to go six weeks in advance before the fall semester. They'll give you all of the readings for the current semester so that you'll have plenty of time to prep for the first day. And the professor walks in on the first day and says, Mr. Jones, Coyle versus Smith. And of course, Mr. Jones has no idea because he hasn't had a father that went to law school. And Mr. Jones is excused for the day. Go down the list until you get somebody who's figured out or knows that this is the way that law school works. And so I had to start reading, and there's a voluminous amount of material that you have to read. And so 
my eyes have gotten worse. And as I become a professor, they've gotten even worse and worse and worse because I now sit there and stare at a computer monitor for lots of time every day working on papers and grading and things like that. It's, it's maybe hurt my eyes. But you don't see people suing the Dell Corporation because they're myopic all of a sudden. It's hard to prove that kind of injury. Now, maybe we're starting. The tobacco lawsuit may have been the, the nose under the camel's tent that led to this product, but it's very easy to see the injury to Willie Searcy in the front seat of his father's Ford. And it's very easy to determine how much money it's going to take for him to survive the rest of his life. By the way, his attorney's got a huge, something like a $250 million judgment against Ford. They estimated that it would take at least $60 million because he needed round-the-clock attention to take care of him for the rest of his life. The jury awarded the rest in punitive damages. Ford insisted that wasn't fair. They went back, the judge reversed the award, dropped it down to $63 million, and Ford still appealed. At the time that Ford appealed, one of the safety features that had been held together to keep Willie Searcy alive failed, and he actually died, and so Ford got out of it with $12 million in judgment against them. But if he had survived, they would have had this huge judgment. That's the reason automobiles, unlike this computer screen, have increased in cost. The first airbags that they deployed, I was very fortunate. The first airbags were designed specifically at that point in time for me. I weigh 185 pounds. I am 5 feet 11 inches tall. That was statistically average for men in this country, and they designed airbags for the statistically average person. For all of you women in the room, the first airbags had a risk if you uh, had them deploy that they could just pop your little head off. <laughs> because they were dangerous. Well, we've learned that that's not, so they've now started manufacturing them so that they are not so, uh, you know, specific to the median and we've made them safer. What's that done? What does it cost if your airbag deploys on your vehicle now? Insurance will not replace them. The cost is that if your airbags deploy and you're in a car wreck, now what happens to your car? It's total. Because we're not just talking, originally the first airbags were just for who? Just the driver. And then it was just the driver and the front seat passenger. How many airbags does a vehicle have today? Yeah, I mean, I've got one in the steering wheel, I've got one in the passenger, I've got side curtain airbags on my car, all kinds of things that have made the car a lot safer. And it's also made the car a lot more expensive. And so a lot of people would say, this is really anti-utilitarian. It's probably bad that Willie Searcy died, and it's a sad situation, but by holding Ford strictly liable, what has that done to the cost for everyone? Well, it means that all of us are paying more for a car. When I was growing up in the 1980s, the average car was around $10,000. When I was born in 1973, the average car was $4,000. The average car price today is $32,000. And why is that? Well, a lot of people would say, well, it's the strict products. I mean, you've increased the misery overall. How do you do the calculus? Let's try one that's even more difficult to think about. And I asked you to look this up. How many of you did that? Nobody looked it up, did you? I asked you to, to Google diethyl still vestrol, DES, which is a case study that's talked about in the book. What is diethyl still best? Did anybody Google it? Did anybody look it up? Wait, how do you spell I said you could just look up DES drug if you Googled it and it would pop up. Diethyl still vestrol is a hormone replacement that was developed starting in the 1940s. They then um, noticed that it could help people who were suffering from miscarriage, or at least that was the hypothesis. There is a lot of controversy as to whether or not the blind studies 
actually indicated that diethylstilbestrol was effective in reducing miscarriages. But let's take for argument's sake the, the argument that it was. So in the 1960s and 70s, I believe it was, they started prescribing this for women who miscarried. So there's a lot of money that goes into the uh, child birth and rearing market, right? It's a huge part of our economy. Most people want to have children. They're not like me. I don't like kids. I, I find children to be very, very unsettling. They make me very, very nervous. You know, I have lots of stuff in my house that's easily breakable, and they come in. I have these two nephews that I used to refer to as seek and destroy. And they, they would show up, and their, I would throw them out, and their mother would become somewhat irate with me. And I'd say, I, I just don't like, I don't like children. And she would say, well, we'll just never come back to your house. Well, fine. <laughs> That's great. But I, I, I am the exception. Most people want to have kids. That's sort of, I think, maybe um, one of our most primal urges is this desire to have children. And so it's become big business. By the way, the first test tube baby turned 40 this year. The first child that was conceived and implanted in vitro through in vitro fertilization, I believe turned 40 this year, or maybe it was 45. So this is an enormously important thing to a lot of people. There are various forms of infertility, but one that can happen is there are certain women that can become pregnant. The, the hardest one to, to deal with is somebody who just cannot become pregnant. They've come up with all kinds of drugs to deal with that in the pharmaceutical industry, or ways to deal with that, including uh, the harvesting of, of eggs. There are a certain percentage of women who, although they can become pregnant, they spontaneously abort. And that's what, and your text talks about this, DES was intended to deal with. DES was intended to allow women who had a hard time carrying a pregnancy to term to carry that pregnancy to term. Years later, after they prescribed this drug for women who had this condition, an interesting thing happened, and the daughters of the offspring born to these women, not the sons, but the daughters, they started to contract, or they came down with uh, vaginal carcinomas that were very rare and very difficult to treat. And of course, who did they then trace it back to, well, they traced it back to the drug diethylstilbestrol, and they sued under a theory of strict drugs liability, and of course won. Now, let's think about this. If the drug hadn't been available, would they have even been born? You're holding the manufacturer liable under a theory of strict products liability for something that's not even reasonably foreseeable. Generally, what we think about when we think about drug trials is is it going to harm the patient? And in the 1950s and 60s, we knew less about what happens to the infant with regard to what can cross the placenta and actually do damage to the, to the child. We now know, as a result of things like diethylstilbestrol, that a lot of drugs actually cross the placenta and can do enormous damage, including alcohol, smoking, and drugs, you know, I mean, illegal, uh, illegal drugs can affect um, these children. But at the time, was it reasonably foreseeable to say, well, somebody taking this pill, that only their daughters would become harmed by this, and it would happen 30 years after they were born? I don't know that that's reasonably foreseeable. The point is, is how do you do the calculus on something like this? First of all, how do you hold a company, I mean, it may not even be the same company 30 years from now. The company may not even be in existence 30 years from now because a lot of companies fall. So how do you hold these manufacturers liable? I don't know. And what you're in effect saying by holding them liable is that it would have been better if these children were never born. How do you do the calculus on that? 
I think that's really problematic. Are you saying it would have been better if they had never been born? Is it better to be born and live 30 years and die of cancer, or is it just better to, I mean, I think most people, and going back to Candide, we talked about this when I talked about Candide, most people love life. And they'll go on clinging to life in even the most dire of circumstances. And so, predicating this on a utilitarian basis, I think, can be somewhat problematic. Other issues that we can talk about with products. It's estimated by marketing scholars that businesses need to engage in constant market innovation and product development, and that they probably should be working on things uh, as many as 25 new ideas at a time in order to meet and keep up with market demand. Why is that? Just as businesses fail, and what is the percentage of businesses that fail within the first five years? Huh? It's over 50%. It depends on who you read. Some will say 80%, some will say 90% actually fail within the first five years. It's at least over 50%. Almost everybody can agree on that. And just as most businesses fail, lots and lots of products fail. And Products fail even in companies that do everything right. So what do we say you should do? Apple, by the way, under Steve Jobs, didn't engage in anything that we would recognize as what we would tell you you should do in terms of developing products successfully. But they were a totally product-driven company, didn't engage in consumer research or anything like that. They started to do that uh, now because Steve, Steve's dead, and I guess there's nobody as brilliant at the top to replace him to think about these things. But they're constantly engaging in new products coming out with new products. Let's take a product as old as Coca-Cola. <coughs> and think about this. Has the um, Wi-Fi been slow today? Well, I'm waiting for this to come up. Products have life cycles, right? Just like people do, we will eventually all die. Products die. Where do you think, let's look at a few all brands. So these are all of Coca-Cola's brands. Some of them you've probably never even heard of. They still have them. How many of you have heard of Tab? You've heard of Tab? How many of you have actually tried a Tab? It was one of the first diet drinks. It's really disgusting. And it was uh, enormously popular. They still keep it because it's obviously in the declining stage, but there's a die-hard contingent of people who just absolutely love tab that are still out there. So products have life cycles. Go through introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline, right? Introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline. And the life cycle of a product can look different than this. You could have a life cycle that looks something like this. What kinds of products have that kind of life cycle? Quickly introduced Bad. fads. Things like what? Crocs. Do you think Crocs are a fad? They, should anyone wear Crocs? Why not? They're horrible. They are ugly. They were wildly comfortable though. My nephew wears them. Aren't they? What? My nephew wears them. Your nephew wears them? 
I've seen a video, there's a guy that he's a sort of YouTube celebrity that gives fashion advice named William Sled, who put out a whole video on just leave Crocs alone. And like, like, <laughs> seen in Crocs, so that's a fad. Um, Beanie Babies. Anybody remember Beanie Babies at one time? Mm -hmm. People were trading these Beanie Babies and selling them for thousands. That's a fad. You can also have products that have life cycles that come and go that are maybe bimodal and then decline. Where do you think Coca-Cola is in its life cycle? Sure. I think it's in decline in the United States. Why? I think that Coke itself is in a decline. I think you can, how, now how do you deal with the product once it goes into decline? What has Coca-Cola done? By the way, Coca-Cola is still, it's now been estimated to be the most valuable brand name in the world, again. It lost out for a couple of years to, um, micro, or to Apple as being the most valuable brand for a couple of years, but it's back to being the number one most valuable brand. I think Coke itself is in decline in this country. What do you do when a product enters into decline well? You can start expanding the market into other areas. And Coke is the most widely recognized product name across the globe. Jimmy Carter had something called the Coca-Cola Connection. His attorney general Bell had been the attorney had been the general counsel for Coca-Cola. His secretary of the Treasury, Blumenthal, had been on the board and served as CEO of Coca-Cola. His uh, Secretary of State had been on the board of Coca-Cola, and what was the first product that we sent to communist China? Coca-Cola. When we opened up and normalized relations with China, that was the first product that we shipped over was Coca-Cola. I think it's in the decline stage in, in this country because we've become far more concerned about what? Health. And we recognize that it's not just, I mean, Coca-Cola is not a health drink in any way, shape, or form. If you have a lot of them, I mean, the amount of calories that you're consuming in a day, if you have, how much does a can, 12 ounce can of Coke have, what's the calories in it? It's over 100. It's over 100 calories, so you're consuming roughly 100 calories per can. You have six cans, well, oh my gosh, what have you done? You've just eaten a meal. If you're trying to lose weight, what do they tell you you should consider to be a meal? for weight loss purposes. Weight loss doctors generally tell you that a meal should be 400 calories or less if you're trying to lose weight. So that's a meal. It's not a low calorie thing. So they came out with Diet Coke. What's wrong with Diet Coke? It tastes awful. They've out, actually now discovered that it also contributes to weight gain, even though it has no calories. The aspartame uh, can create hunger feelings and cause you to overeat. And also there's something called the health halo effect that happens. People switch to Diet Coke and they think, oh, I'm being healthy, I'm eating or I'm drinking, consuming less calories. And so they then do what? They eat more. They um, do this with all kinds of snack foods. That they say it's just 100 calories and so people will start doing what? Oh, it's just 100 calories so they'll have four of them. Well, now you're 400 calories, and what is it if you want to lose weight? Well, that's a meal. And so you've just replaced basically one meal if you have these little healthy snacks that you think are there. So I think Diet Coke and Coke actually in this country are in the decline stage, which is one of the reasons why Coca-Cola has had to come up with all these other products to keep relevant in the marketplace. So what is on the increase? I never thought you would see a day when people would pay more for a gallon of water than they would pay for a gallon of gas. But we've hit that happy point, haven't we, with all the bottled waters, the mineral waters, Dasani. And so Coca-Cola, in order to compete, has come up with these. Their brand of water is Dasani. They have all of the energy drinks, which have now become more popular, and things like that. The Powerade, those uh, sports energy drinks. And so we constantly have to be coming up with new ideas. Because products, just like businesses, will often fail, and Coca-Cola was a prime example of how even a very strong product uh, and a strong company can fail. In the 1980s, in the late 1980s, Coca-Cola 
Um, Coca-Cola was locked in the heat with Pepsi for market share, and Pepsi comes up with something called the Pepsi Challenge. Anybody remember this? Turns out that in blind taste tests, now there was a lot that was concerned with the methodology. Some people accused Pepsi of serving Coca-Cola warm and Pepsi cold, but most experts agree that the biggest thing that happened was, and the problem with the method in doing the Pepsi Challenge, was that if people drank a small amount of Pepsi, they preferred Pepsi over Coke, two to one. But it was only for one ounce, because that was the sample size that they gave you. And most people like something that's that sweet for about one ounce. If you're over eight years old, and your taste buds and your palate have changed, you probably don't want something that sweet for 12 ounces. And how many of you think that Coca-Cola is even too sweet? I, I can't drink a real Coke anymore. I've drank Diet Coke for so long that I can't even stand to drink a full real Coke. Every once in a while, I'll try one, and I'll think, God, that's good, for about one drink, and then I have to go back to the Diet Coke, because it's, it's just overly sweet. So Coke decides that based on this, the Pepsi Challenge and all this stuff, we've got to come up with a way. OK, and my computer. Phone is dead, so let me go make sure this is still recording. There we go. So they decide that they're going to have to meet Pepsi's challenge, and they come out with New Coke. And New Coke was a what? A disaster. It fell flat on its face. So even huge companies, yeah. Is there a conspiracy that they released new coke in order to introduce high fructose corn syrup? Or they reintroduce classic coke? I don't. I, I don't know that that's true. The growth phase. I I just know that it was you know a marketing failure. I've never heard anything that they used high fructose corn syrup. I mean that's used in almost everything, and it's a it's amazing the number of products that you'll have that will have high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I know that most people just absolutely rebelled and, and the product was a failure. So even large products and large companies can be taken down. And this presents ethical issues. And I want you to think about this in terms of whether or not products or companies are too big to fail. I wanted to tell a story that uh, that really obsessed me when I was writing my book, and um, it's a story of something that happened 3,000 years ago when the kingdom of Israel was in its infancy. It takes place in an area called the Shephelah, um, in what is now uh, Israel. And the reason the story obsessed me is that I thought I understood it, and then I went back over it and I realized that I didn't understand it at all. Um, ancient Palestine had a uh, along its eastern border, there's a mountain range, still the same is true of Israel today, and in the mountain range are all of the ancient cities of that region. It's 
so Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron. Um, and then there's a coastal plain right along the Mediterranean where Tel Aviv is now. And connecting the mountain range with the coastal plain is an area called the Shephelim, which is a series of valleys and ridges that run east to west. You can follow the Shephelim, through the, go through the Shephelim to get from the coastal plain to the mountains. And the Shephelim, if you've been to Israel, you'll know it's just about the most beautiful part of Israel. It's gorgeous with uh, forests of oak and wheat fields and vineyards. And, but more importantly, though, in the history of that region, it served, it's had a, a, a real strategic function. And that is, it is the means by which hostile armies on the coastal plain find their way, get, get up into the mountains and threaten those living in the mountains. And 3,000 years ago, that's exactly what happens. The Philistines, who are the, the biggest of enemies of the kingdom of Israel, are living in the coastal plain. They're originally from Crete, they're seafaring people. And they may start to make their way through one of the valleys of the Shephelah, up into the mountains, because what they want to do is occupy the highland area right by Bethlehem and split the kingdom of Israel in two. And the kingdom of Israel, which is headed by King Saul, obviously catches wind of this, and Saul brings his army down from the mountains, and he confronts the Philistines in the Valley of Elah one of the most beautiful of the valleys of the Shepherd. And the Israelites dig in along the northern ridge, and the, uh, the Philistines dig in along the southern ridge, and the two armies just sit there for weeks and stare at each other because they're deadlocked. Neither can attack the other because to attack the other side, you've got to come down the mountain into the valley and then up the other side, and you're completely exposed. So finally, to break the deadlock, the Philistines send their mightiest warrior down into the valley floor calls out and he says to the Israelites, send your mightiest warrior down and we'll have this out, just the two of us. This was a tradition in ancient warfare called single combat. It was a way of settling disputes without incurring the bloodshed of the major battle. And the Philistine who sent down their mighty warrior is a giant. He's six foot nine. Uh, he's outfitted head to toe in this glittering bronze armor. And he's got a sword and he's got a javelin, he's got a spear. He is absolutely terrifying. And he's so terrifying that none of the Israelite soldiers want to fight him. It's a, it's a death wish, right? There's no way they think they can take him. And finally, the only person who will come forward is this young shepherd boy. He goes up to Saul, he says, I'll fight him. And Saul says, you, Saul says, you can't fight him. That's ridiculous. You're this kid. This is this mighty warrior. But the shepherd is adamant. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. I have been defending my flock against uh, lions and wolves for years, I think I can do it. And Saul has no choice. He's got no one else has come for him. So he says, all right. And then he turns to the kid. He says, but you've got to wear this armor. You can't go as you are. So he tries to give the shepherd his armor, and the shepherd says, no. He says, I, I, I can't wear this stuff. I, I, the biblical verse is, I, have not, I cannot wear this for I have not proved it. Meaning, I've never worn armor before. You've got to be crazy. So he reaches down instead on the ground, picks up five stones, and puts them in his shepherd's bag, and starts to walk down the mountainside to meet the giant. And the giant, sees this figure approaching him, calls out, come to me so I can feed your flesh to the, to the birds of the heavens and the, and the beasts of the field, right? It issues this kind of taunt towards this person coming to fight him. And the shepherd draws closer and closer, and the giant sees him. He's carrying a staff. That's all he's carrying. A simple weapon, just this shepherd's staff. And he says, am I a, he's insulted. Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? Right. And the shepherd boy takes one of his stones out of his pocket, puts it in his sling, rolls it around, lets it fly, and hits the giant right between the eyes, like right here, his most vulnerable spot, and falls down, either dead or unconscious. And the shepherd boy runs up and takes his sword cuts up his head, and the Philistines see this, and they turn, and they just run. And of course, the name of the giant is Goliath, and the name of the shepherd boy is David, and the reason that story has obsessed me over the course of writing my book is that everything I thought I knew about that story turned into the wrong. So David in that story is supposed to be the underdog, right? 
In fact, that term, David and Goliath, has entered our language as a metaphor for improbable victories by some weak party over someone far stronger. Now, why do we call David an underdog? Well, we call him an underdog because he's a kid, little kid, and Goliath is this big, strong giant. We also call him an underdog because uh, Goliath is an experienced warrior, and David is just a shepherd. But most importantly, we call him an underdog because all he has is his giant is that, is that Goliath is outfitted with all of this modern weaponry, this glittering coat of armor and a, and a, a sword and a javelin and a spear, and all David has is this sling. Well, let's start there with the phrase, all David has is this sling, because that's the first mistake that we make. In ancient warfare, there are three kinds of warriors. There's cavalry, men on horseback and in with chariots. There is heavy infantry, which are foot soldiers, armed foot soldiers with uh, swords and shields and some kind of armor. And there is artillery. And artillery are archers, but more importantly, slingers. And a slinger is someone who has a leather pouch with two long cords attached to it. And they put a projectile, either a rock or a lead ball, inside the pouch. And they whirl it around like this. And they let one of the cords go. And the effect is to send the projectile forward at, um, uh, towards its target. That's what David has. And it's important to understand that that sling is not a slingshot. It's not this, right? It's not a child's toy. It's, in fact, an incredibly devastating weapon. When David rolls it around like this, he's, he's turning his, uh, the sling around probably at six or seven revolutions per second. And that means that when the ball is, when the rock is released, it's going forward really fast, probably 35 meters per second. That's substantially faster than uh, uh, baseball thrown by um, even the finest of baseball pitchers. More than that, the stones in the Valley of Elah were not normal rocks. They were barium sulfate, which are rocks twice the density of normal stones. If you do the calculations on the ballistic, on the stopping power, of the rock fired from David's sling, it's roughly equal to the stopping power of a 45 millimeter handgun. This is an incredibly devastating weapon. Accuracy, we know from uh, historical records that slingers uh, had, experienced slingers could hit um, and maim or, serious or, or even kill a target at distances of up to 200 yards. From medieval tapestries, uh, we know that slingers were capable of hitting birds in flight. They're incredibly accurate. When David lines up, and he's not 200 yards away from Goliath, he's quite close to Goliath. When he lines up and fires that thing at Goliath, there is, he has every intention and every expectation of being able to hit Goliath at his most vulnerable spot between his eyes. If you go back over the history of ancient warfare, you will find time and time again that slingers were the decisive factor against infantry in one kind of battle, it's heavy infantry in one kind of battle um, or another. So what's Goliath? He's heavy infantry. And his expectation when he challenges the Israelites to a duel is that he's going to be fighting another heavy infantry. Right? When he says, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, the key phrase is come to me. Come up to me because we're going to fight hand to hand like this. Saul has the same expectation. David says, I want to fight Goliath, and Saul tries to give him his armor, because Saul is thinking, oh, when you say fight Goliath, you mean fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, infantry on infantry. But David has absolutely no expectation, no, he's not going to fight him that way. Why would he? He's a shepherd. He spent his entire career using a sling to defend his flock against lions and wolves. That's where his strength lies. So here he is, this shepherd, experienced in the use of a devastating weapon, up against this lumbering giant, weighed down by a hundred pounds of armor, and these incredibly heavy weapons that are useful only in short-range combat. Goliath is a sitting duck. He doesn't have a chance. So why do we keep calling David an underdog, and why do we keep referring to his victory as in God? The second piece of this that's important. It's not just that we misunderstand David and his choice of weaponry. It's also that we profoundly misunderstand Goliath. 
Goliath is not what he seems to be. There's all kinds of hints of this in the biblical text. Um, things that are, in retrospect, are quite puzzling and don't square with his image as this mighty warrior. So to begin with, the Bible says that Goliath is led onto the valley floor by an attendant. Now that is weird, right? Here is this mighty warrior going, challenging the Israelites to one-on-one -on -one combat. Why is he being led by the hand, by some you know, young boy, presumably, to the point of combat? Secondly, the Bible story uh, makes special note of how slowly Goliath moves. Another odd thing to say when you're describing the mightiest warrior known to man at that point, right? And then there's this whole weird thing about how long it takes Goliath to react to the, to the sight of David. So David's coming down the mountain, and he's clearly not preparing for hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? There is nothing about him that says, I'm about to fight you like this. He's not even carrying a sword. Why does Goliath not react to that? as if he's oblivious to what's going on that day. And then there's this strange, that strange comment he makes to David. Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? Right. Sticks? David only has one stick. Well, it turns out that there's been a great deal of speculation within the medical community over the years about uh, whether there's something wrong with, fundamentally wrong with Goliath, an attempt to make sense of all of those apparent anomalies. There are many articles written. The first one was in 1960 in the Indiana uh, Medical Journal. And it started a chain of speculation that starts with an explanation for Goliath's height. So Goliath is <coughs> head and shoulders above all of his peers in that era. And usually when someone is that far out of the norm, there's an explanation for it. So the most common form of giantism uh, is a condition called acromegaly. And acromegaly is caused by a benign tumor on your uh, pituitary gland that causes an overproduction of human growth. And throughout history, many of the most famous giants have all had acromegaly. So the tallest person of all time is a guy named Robert Wadley, who was still growing when he died at the age of 24, and he was 8 foot 11. He had acromegaly. Do you remember the wrestler Andre the Giant? And he had acromegaly. There's even speculation that uh, Abraham Lincoln had acromegaly. Anyone who's unusually tall, that's the first uh, explanation to come up with. And acromegaly has a very distinct set of side effects associated with it, principally having to do with uh, vision. Uh, the pituitary tumor, as it grows, often starts to compress the visual nerves in your brain, with the result that people with acromegaly have either uh, double vision, or they are profoundly nearsighted. So when, we, when people have started to speculate about what might have been wrong with Goliath, they said, wait a minute, he looks and sounds an awful lot like someone who has acromegaly. And that would also explain so much of what was strange about his behavior that day. Why does he move so slowly and have to be escorted down into the valley floor by an attendant? Because he can't make his way on his own. Why is he so strangely oblivious to David that he doesn't understand that David's not going to fight him until the very last moment? Because he can't see him. When he says, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, the phrase come to me is a hint also of his vulnerability. Come to me because I can't see you. And then there's, uh, am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? He sees two sticks when David has only one. So the Israelites up on the mountain ridge looking down on him thought he was this extraordinarily powerful foe. What they didn't understand was that the very thing that was the source of his apparent strength was also the source of his greatest weakness. And there is, I think, in that a very important lesson for all of us. Giants are not as strong and powerful as they see. And sometimes the shepherd boy has a slave attack. So the reason I show you this is in many instances when 
we talk about product development and marketing ethics, we always focus externally on the outside of the firm and what happens to our customers when we don't produce something that is uh, a great product and may harm people. But marketing is a fully integrated function of the firm. So marketers have to work across not just external constituents, but also internal constituents. And internal to the firm are our shareholders. And so I think when we think about product development, we have to think about not only the impacts that it has on society, but also the impact that it will have on our shareholders and our stockholders. I think we have an ethical duty to do that. And the reason that I point this out is because in many respects, a lot of times we think that companies are engaging in really uh, great things, and then they have, like Coca-Cola, these product launches that are utter failures. And one of the things that I think you have a duty to do as a corporation in protecting shareholder wealth is engage in that fiduciary duty of not making waste. Now, this is generally covered by something at law called, you have this fiduciary duty at law, and the Court of Chancery in Delaware has expounded on this a lot. It's called the business judgment rule which says, yes, you have a duty to not create waste for your shareholders, but generally speaking, we're going to allow officers and directors a lot of leeway in determining what's going to go on in business because business is inherently risky, and this is called the business judgment rule, and we see it in things like, oh, the Disney case. In Ray Disney is one of the most fascinating cases that deals with the business judgment rule that, that we have out there. So Disney hires under Michael Eisner this guy to be head of Disney theme parks who's never been... Uh, a CEO of a major publicly traded company before. He had been a very successful agent for a lot of stars in Hollywood. And so Eisner, of course, says, well, you know, he's been a successful guy. He's run his own company. He was a multimillionaire. Surely he can run Disney theme parks. And the attorneys for Disney testified in the Delaware Court of Chancery that once the guy showed up, they had to follow him around with a bucket and shovel to clean up the crap that he created. Um, and the Court of Chancery still says, well, they, Michael Eisner didn't create waste, even though he gave him something called a golden parachute or a platinum parachute, uh, which made it more lucrative for him to get fired than it actually did for him to work for Disney. And they said this is covered under the business judgment rule. Well, I think we have to think about things like this. When Coca-Cola goes off and launches new Coke and it's an utter failure, I think we have to think about the ethical implications, not just for our consumer, but for our shareholder. And I think that this is an interesting video from two perspectives. First of all, it forces us to rethink what we might think about big business, which is that they're invulnerable and will never fail. What's happening to Walmart right now? They're closing stores. Why? They decided they went out on this venture, and by the way, the people in Luther are really upset by this because they, they took a beloved soccer field. Now, I, I can't imagine that there were actually that many people in Luther that played soccer. You know, I, I mean, that sort of communist sport Luther is uh, uh, rather a uh, rural area, but apparently they've taken over this beloved soccer field. They opened a little store, now they're closing. They're having to retrench. And part of it is because as you become a big corporation, I think you become more and more susceptible to maybe someone who can take you out fairly easily because you don't think things through quickly enough. Yeah, and it shows that they have failures just like everyone else, because the Walmart Express has failed everywhere, all of them are getting closed. Right, yep, everywhere. They're closing all, what is it, 900 of them or something like that? It's a ridiculous yeah. Well, that's a good place to stop for today. We'll talk about um, the other P's. We're starting on uh, Tuesday and finish up on Thursday. And uh, then we'll be Time to listen to almost except the finals. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do an ad so we can look at ads for Tuesday. Let's do ads on.